Hey, hi everyone. Um, so we have an audience in the room here. We have an audience at home. Um, we've got a very interesting talk lined up today. We're delighted to have Samantha Dockery and Neil Smith here to talk to us. Um, very brief introduce, introduction. So uh, Samantha is a senior lecturer here in the School of Applied Psychology in UCC. Um, she, her, in, her research interest is in uh, the psychobiology of uh, adolescence um, and lots of other things as well, but like that's kind of the, the core of it. Um, and then we also have Neil Smith, who's a, a patient advocate for common syndrome. And I will just hand over to Samantha there. And just a note to everyone that the, we are recording the talk. So if you do want to see a copy of it afterwards, you can just kind of get in touch and, and we, we can do that. Um, but it, we have, we'll be recording the slides. We'll be recording anyone who kind of contributes, you know, if you, if you ask a question or something like that as well, that will be encoded, including the recording. So just, just to let you all know. Okay. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Connor, and thanks everyone for being here today and for joining us online. The, you can see the title of today's talk um, here, The Psychological and Social, very long worded, for those who know me, are probably not that surprised, The Psychological and Social Lived Experience of Kalman Syndrome. And what we, Neil and I want to do today is talk about how a research study originated, um, the patient's perspective, the research study, and then open it up to questions. Um, before we begin, I want to introduce Neil. Neil and I have known each other for about four years now. We met on Twitter, like a very modern meeting. Um, and Neil is a patient advocate. He is um, an expert on Corman syndrome, on people who live with a rare condition. Um, and Neil himself will talk to you about what Corman syndrome or CAH is. But what I have shown up on screen is the breadth of Neil's engagement across the very kind of academic arena, paper in BMJ and paper in, I don't even know what that magazine is, but I think it's one of those kind of trashy ones that you pick up there. Mm -hmm. Just to show kind of the, the, the breadth, but also the depth of thinking and expertise that Neil has um, in working with and for people who have Coleman or CAH. Neil, um, I think for three decades, you might be aging you there, Neil, but <laughs> uh, for three decades has been contributing to um, patient forums, leading patient forums, organising and building patient networks, including more recently working with Dr. Andrew Dwyer um, over in the States uh, to look at how to do this in this online space and what that might be, have advantages for people with rare conditions. So. Um, I've learned so much from Neil. Um, Neil was the person who first started to turn my mind to the research question, that is what happens when people don't experience puberty. And, um, and I've learned a lot from him, both in terms of, I guess, the biomedical stuff, but also the psychosocial experience and how it might be interpreted by someone who has a lot of, I guess, expertise and insight from the psychosocial things, that, that's me, in case you didn't know, but also someone who has developed this insight by dint of working in that arena and supporting people. So I'll stop talking now and pass over to Neil, who's going to present um, uh, his talk, and then I'm going to present the research element, and then we'll open it up to bring ourselves together. So I'll hand over to you now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I just briefly want to run through quickly what Kalman syndrome is, just the physical symptoms of the condition, because it's quite a rare condition and not many people may have heard of it. Then I'll briefly do my own personal experience as a patient advocate. Then we'll go on to the more interesting, hopefully, bit of psychology and then the research involved with Dr. Dockway. Just to run through a quick slide, it was rare disease day a couple of weeks ago, and I produced a few slides to send out on Twitter, Instagram, just to the very basis of Kalman syndrome. So, Cameron syndrome is a condition called hypogonadic trophic hypogonadism. Far oh, too long a word. HH is a short way of saying, describing it. It's a medical condition, hormone condition that affects puberty. So, get the right button here. Cameron syndrome and HH are almost identical. The only difference is Cameron syndrome has no sense of smell. HH has a normal sense of smell. I'll probably keep calling it Cameron syndrome, but HH is a dead sort of Kalman syndrome. 
main symptom is the failure to start puberty or fully complete puberty. There's a range of range of symptoms in Kamen syndrome. Some that have no puberty at all, they stop at Anna stage two, have no development since childhood. Some have partial puberty, are actually almost subfertile, but do not fully complete puberty. It's normally present at birth, congenital, but it can be acquired during life as no as, as sort of like an acquired or a functional form of condition where it happens after puberty, then the reproductive function stops due to external functions like stress, diet, that's rare, it's normally congenital, present for birth. So one thing I always want to try and point out, it's not the same as delayed or late puberty. There's a condition called delayed puberty where puberty starts late in 15 or 16, but then starts normally either with no treatment or a little six months of treatment. That's delayed puberty where that has no set of psychological problems where you're probably left out of a social group. But K common syndrome of HH is not the same as delayed because puberty still does not start at all and treatment is needed or lifelong and people are infertile lifelong. Puberty just does not start at all. It's a fundamental difference than actual delayed puberty. And sometimes these groups get mixed up. And part of my patient advocate, I like to make sure Kalman syndrome is separated from delayed puberty. The very basics, the hypothalamus pituitary and gonads, testes or ovaries, the main cause of condition is the hypothalamus not talking to the pituitary correctly. That communication breaks down to stop everything further down from happening. So because the hypothalamus doesn't talk to the pituitary correctly, there's no testosterone produced, no sperm produced, and eggs aren't released. So puberty does not start, and there's no, no reduction, no fertility at all, just because of the problem at this end. Very rare condition. These numbers are guesses because it's so rare. People, it's probably one in 50,000. It's more likely to diagnose in males, because females normally misdiagnose with other conditions. There's no real reason for sex differences. And it's lack of puberty, incidentally, is treatable, difficult to diagnose, wide range of presentation, but there are treatments available both for the physical symptoms and fertility once diagnosed correctly. I'm going through this quickly because these are the physical signs. I really want to get on the psychology. I can go back to this and ask questions later. But this is something that's almost, we think is quite important stage, is this mini puberty that happens six, at six months old, or between, between birth and six months of age. It's a mini puberty where the baby or fetal pituitary takes over from the maternal, maternal pituitary. And it's supposed to be a, a peak of hormone production in the baby, which then goes down to zero until puberty is supposed to start. This is missing in Kalman syndrome patients. And we think this could be quite important to future development because this is missing. So normal puberty, so today puberty starts late, but it becomes normal. But this is Kalman syndrome here, where you get totally absent puberty or partial puberty in adulthood. That, that's where my condition is. I'm virtually down there. There's a, like a range of between absent and partial, as opposed to normal there. Right. So, yeah, there's extra symptoms that happen with Kalman syndrome. Not all these happen. It depends on the genetics involved. So somebody may have one or two of these extra symptoms or none at all. Minus, I myself have no sense of smell and partial deafness for the Kalman syndrome, but I don't have any of the other symptoms. Other friends of mine have some of these extra symptoms it really does depend on the genetics involved and it's quite a wide range and severity. Some people are no puberty at all, some are partial, so it's a very wide presentation. But some of these do occur, but not, not everybody. And it's just normal puberty, seeing the male and female. And treatment is either going through what we would call puberty in the British commons, because you want to get the Sexually sex characteristics we will look like, get the hair growth, muscle growth, voice breaking, acne, and worse, and the fertility treatments as well. So there's two separate forms of treatment. 
this is easy to get because this is straightforward hormone replacement therapy, which is testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. Fertility treatment can be more extensive and difficult to get hold of, and you have to take it lifelong because the pituitary is not functioning correctly at all. So you have to have these hormones to replace what's missing. That's the quick bit. I can go back if any questions on. This is my story. I gave this presentation at a meeting I did somewhere else in Turkey, but so. Oh, there's your picture. That's me at 18, uh, upper sixth form, last year of school, when I actually had a bit of hair, but I was the smallest in the year. That was how I looked. So, normal childhood, as far as I know. <laughs> Late developed in terms of walking, talking, but academically it was just normal at school, nothing special, nothing not especially talented, but just, just normal. Hearing problems identified during school days, and my lack of sense of smell was noted, but I didn't. It didn't bother me much. I didn't make, take, make much note of it. So I had my sense of smell and my hearing problems, but nobody at the time linked it to do, linked it to being a late developer. None of my doctors said these two are linked. They just said I had a routine examination by a school nurse or paper round. They sent me to my GP, and my GP said, "Go away, you're a late developer. I don't want to see you again." That's my 18th birthday party. I, I don't think I look 18 there, but okay. So my GP said, go away, late bloomer. I saw the GP twice at 18 and 19. They still said, go away. Even at 19, they said, well, you're a late bloomer, which is completely wrong because I had the extra symptoms. I just assumed it would happen. I went to university, still as a late bloomer. I started, I was starting a low dose of test for hopefully to keep start puberty. Nothing happened. So I was just left until I was, at that age, I was just, you believe what the doctor told you. No obvious changes. I was still at standard stage two while I was at university. And then just almost stopped caring about it because I just assumed something would happen eventually. And I just wasn't trusting the doctors with they were just saying, wait and see. The diagnosis came quite late for me at 23. Some people get diagnosed a lot earlier, which helps. I was 23. I got some of my friends I knew at 30 or 40. It means dependency in the right doctor in the right place. I had no treatment since 18, and I was diagnosed probably at 23. After I self referred myself to an endocrinologist, but I worked at all three with this endocrinologist, and it just happened to say, Do you have a sense of smell? No doctor had asked me that question before. I knew I couldn't smell, and I never told a doctor that, but they never asked me. But then that's how that's diagnosis. Because puberty and that's as well don't see no link, but there's a there's a very good reason which I can go into with our slides why puberty and sensor are linked. It's a bit of a long story, but it's quite a nice one I think. But so I've been doing this since 23 and I've been on various forms of treatments to test over and been antropic ever since. Putting the name condition really helped. Because at that point I was alone. I just thought I was a late bloomer, nobody to talk to, nobody knew about the condition. At 23, I met my first person with a condition, and that changed everything. The person I met, someone called Mark, said a patient group called Hypo AHH, and he was the first patient advocate for this condition. And he's still around, quite happily. And he sent out the booklet, newsletters, and patient meetings. He did a brilliant job sending these things in the 1990s because he was the patient advocate, and he was, did such a good job. And I didn't help him at the time because it wasn't. I should have done, but I wasn't very good then. But since the 2000s, I've tried with other people. I'm not alone in this. There are other people who are patient advocates in different countries. There are other people doing these things. But we set Facebook groups, patient meetings, and other ways of getting patients to interact with each other. Because it's a rare disorder, geographically widespread, it's helpful for patients to connect with each other online, which then helps them to ask questions about the condition, learn more about the condition, know what to, questions to ask their doctors about it, so learn more about diagnosis and treatment, and also just to find somebody else with a condition, to be able to talk to somebody with the same condition, so you know you're not isolated anymore. So you may you may not want to meet them in person, but at least you know on the other end of a Facebook group, there's somebody who knows exactly what you're going through. So we've got patient groups, Hyper HH and IMHH 
they're patient groups for us who help patients coordinate and to connect to each other and just to talk and know more about the condition. Now, sometimes yeah, sharing information helps, but also you need a doctor to be able to accept the information that patients will get. Sometimes doctors do not like informed patients, but the information has to be good quality information and concise to be able to give the doctor say, I want this question answered. There's no point to say, I just saw this on the internet. You've got to be able to ask the right question. So the patient groups are helpful to know, I, what about this form of treatment? This is, why, why don't we do this particular test? And then the patient groups can help when, if a doctor orders a certain test, why is this test been ordered? We can take the time to say, this is why it's been done. This is why you want this sort of treatment. This is what you can expect. Because we've got more time than doctors have to explain what's happening behind the scenes. Because 10, 15 minutes consultation, doctors got no time to talk about the treatment. And we had patient advocates for more time, we can help patients. Some patients don't need to interact with the patient groups. They just want to be there. So our patient, one of our patient groups that somebody runs on Facebook, the big group, somebody else runs it, is about, about 1,200 people in that group. Only about 50 possibly talk, but the fact is there, people know it's there for people to talk to if they want. They can just access information that they want. They don't need to interact. But it's just nice to know the information is there. We've had this situation come up recently where Facebook groups sometimes have a negative, negative impact because people will ask the information of in the groups. The people who are coping with work condition, I just haven't, don't have the time to spend in the groups. So sometimes the patient groups have a little bit more negative. So sometimes it helps to have the people who are doing well with the condition to talk as well, just give a more balanced outlook. And any work condition, Patients have to be their own experts because we have to tell the doctors a bit of collaborate together to work to ask the right questions and like a transfer of information between the two. Only occasionally we get to doctors who just don't want to talk to patients who they, they know best. Sometimes we get this with a delayed puberty right at the start at 15, 16, they say, well, you're just a late bloomer. I don't need to know anything else. So we can go to them and say, well, you've got all these other symptoms. No sense of smell. You've got Poor hearing, got cleft lip. Surely you should, it could be the salmon syndrome. Oh no, it's just delayed puberty. We can always say to them, this is what's happening. And we're a good link with the professionals and patients who have got more time to talk. Now, for me, the physical symptoms are less now because I'm more used to condition. It's the psychology. And this is something which I think has been missed completely by all our healthcare professionals. Even the experts on Kelman syndrome don't have the time to even study psychology. And Dr. Dockway will be mentioning this later, where it's probably so under, as underestimated the effect between male and female patients that psychology and missing out on both puberty and adolescence. It's not delayed puberty, it's like missing out complete separate development and also the impact that has going on to your life. And no, the patient doesn't have anybody to talk to who can recognise what this is happening. All they've got is fellow patients who can sometimes help, but it's nice to have some professional insight of how we can help patients. Early treatment diagnosis is very helpful, but not always. There are some things where early treatment can help, but they still need some help with just acknowledging the psychology problems of being in a different group or being isolated. And then different symptoms, different severities, even different patients probably need different help at different times because not every case, not every case is the same. So some may need no help at all, they just need to be aware help is available. Some may need extra help for their condition. This is where our patient group that's where, that's, where, that's, that's one of the responses you've got when you come in. I've brushed through my bit. I can ask questions later, especially about physical symptoms, but psychology is more important. I'm trying to go back to that. Yeah. Thanks so much. That was a great summary, Neil, of both what the syndrome is, 
but also what it might be like to be someone with a rare condition and the need to be in contact with other people with the rare condition. But also kind of highlighting that rarely has the psychosocial aspects of Coleman been considered. And um, four years ago, I looked it up yesterday to see what was the date stamp on our Twitter messages between Neil and I, and I had published a few papers on puberty and Neil said, I'd like to read those papers. And I said, sure, I'll send them on. And he said, do you ever think about what happens? when puberty doesn't happen. You talk about puberty having effects on the brain, you talk about puberty having effects on this person's social life, on their psychological development, on the environment that they create with their peers. But what happens if puberty doesn't happen? How does the person think about themselves? How do they understand themselves in the very social world of adolescence? And Neil just said, like, you don't have puberty and you don't have adolescence. I, I'm not, I don't agree with that quite, but the two are entwined. Um, and Neil pointed out that there is this mini puberty that happens in the first kind of six months of life. And that drives some of the maturation of the brain and some of the changes. So we might think about how might that change the person's experience as they grow. So that, that is a quote from, from one of the research participants who's like, well, you should have grown out of that by now. Um, and so I have always in my research framed adolescence and puberty as distinct from each other but they relate very closely to each other. So adolescence occurs concurrently with puberty. Puberty is always described as the biological process and adolescence is the psychosocial development. But biological processes influence who we are. We talk about this as both a direct influence, we have this direct and indirect effects models in developmental psychobiology and we say that well, the physiological processes of puberty, as testosterone begins to rise, as estrogen changes, as progesterone changes, as these things change, it changes things going on in the brain. It's a direct biology. So here comes the hormone, interacts with the brain cells or neurocircuitry of the brain and changes. And we see this very clearly in people's experiences of anxiety and depression and aggression. And we talk about those as being uh, driven by the fluctuating and the peaking of hormones. And we know that with the changes in these hormones, there are, it kind of drives some brain development in certain ways. Not always in the good, like for anxiety and depression and aggression, not always great. But puberty also results in a change in how the person looks. Their body shape changes, their body size changes, their body hair changes, boobs, butts, you name it. You, you can, I, I won't describe them all. You know what they are. Mm -hmm. right? I don't want to act this out now. <laughs> but anyway, there's lots of changes um, for people who go through puberty. And these changes in how the person looks drives changes in how they think about themselves. So as they see their body changing and they compare it to others or it elicits certain changes in how people behave towards them. So I want you to think about how people interact with someone who might be 12 or 13 but looks much older than they are because they're taller or they might have more muscle mass or they have larger boobs or more, more apparent boobs or whatever it is. I don't know, I can't say breast now, boobs. <laughs> um, but it changes how other people relate to the person. So the old, if they look older, they may be given more responsibilities. They may have more kind of romantic interests from other people, whether they're prepared for it or not. So they may be 12 and they may appear older. And so we always, what, what traditionally in developmental psychobiology, when we try and understand how puberty influences behaviour and the development of identity, we see it as both a direct biological pathway and an indirect pathway where when your body changes, people change how they interact with you. You start to think about yourself differently. You have different social opportunities. And the person's understanding of the world and themselves in it is forming across the adolescent period into the 20s. And puberty is driving part of this. So when Neil says, like, what happens if that doesn't happen? I went, well, we just don't think about that. In psychology, we're always like early timing, late timing, fast timing, slow timing, never, no timing. Right? And I became really intrigued with this. And kind of Neil was prompting me around this. And I did a bit of reading and became more and more interested and listen, did a lot of reading, um, both in terms of patient experiences. Neil's own paper got back in 2013, I think, in the BNJ. I think it was 2013. Yeah. yeah. Um, and thought, why aren't people talking about this more? Sure, it's a rare condition, but there's still a lot of people, right? And if nothing else, it should give us some insight into how we understand how puberty and adolescence drives our lives forward. 
So together with a colleague, Nadine Mesley burdy some of you I know know her, um, we looked at the literature. What had been published? So we'd always been saying nothing's been published. You know, the, the classic mistake of a, a scientist say, no one's ever done this before. <laughs> I'm going to do it. And so we trawled through the literature to see what was being reported about the absence of puberty and psychological development during adolescence. And it was a scoping review and um, this paper, this poster was presented at the European Association of Research on Adolescence. Um, and we identified almost 2,000 papers and lucky for us, we got to read them all to see whether they talked about any psychosocial aspects of absent puberty. Um, 26 of them had, so we were very broad in our inclusion criteria. So it could be a chapter, it could be a letter published in a journal, um, wherever we were looking for it. But there are very few that talk about the psychosocial aspects. And where they did exist, they tended to be the practitioner, the medic, the endocrinologist making an observation about the people they'd seen in practice based on their understanding and the, uh, the appointments or consultations that they may have had. And I think that's valid, but what they tend to emphasise is psychosexual development and health-related quality of life. Very f A few indicated that um, people with KS may have symptom, higher symptoms of anxiety and depression and difficulties with body self-esteem or body image. Um, but these are often their observations. There was no, um, no, certainly no psychometric measures and very few, in fact, none um, reports of the patient experience. So what was it like? How did people understand the experience of having KS? And they typically didn't distinguish between age or generational cohorts. So was someone born in the 40s or the 50s or the 70s or the 80s or the 90s? And I would think that matters. So from my perspective, the context in which you grow, the social context and how people frame, say, for example, the body ideal or what it means to be a man or a woman or what it means to go through those teen years matters enormously. And this understandably wasn't represented. So this isn't a criticism, but an observation. But none of them explored or commented or speculated about how this might be important to understand as the person develops. So that kind of provided the foundation for the research study that is a collaboration between myself and Neil and Dr. Andrew Dwyer, um, looking at how do people with KS describe their psychological experience, their social experience. So we developed a semi-structured interview to explore people's experiences, how they recalled their adolescent time, how they thought about their diagnosis now, um, their treatment. It was a very kind of semi-structured but very broad ranging interviews that we did with people. Um, with Neil's help, we recruited through the patient networks themselves. Um, and we ended up interviewing seven men and seven women and we provided participants with a guide to what was going to happen during the interview. So what, what were the questions or what were the areas we were going to ask them to do? In part so that people could think ahead of time and decide, like, actually, I don't want to talk about that. And so they could prepare themselves. But what happened is that most people came with a sheaf of notes. And, and it's like, let me just look at page 11 now. And I want to come back to that. Um, so it's very effective. Uh, they were all done online. This was, I think, during COVID time, was it? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, and, but, but of course, people are, were all over the world, so I couldn't have met up with them anyway, so unfortunately. Um, and then in, for the study that I'm going to describe today, I'm only describing some preliminary and indicative results. Um, I'm using interpretive phenomenological analysis to try and understand the person's lived experience, just for the psychological and just for the social. There's lots of other information that people shared and reflections around their diagnosis and treatment and so on. So, um, so I've been working on this analysis for months and months and months and months and months. And I, I'm starting to feel like I will never be done. Um, as, as some of you in the room would know, I'm traditionally not a qualitative <laughs> researcher, I use qualitative methods. And I've learned a lot about what I bring to my interpretations of it. I found it uh, actually quite difficult a lot of the time in um, the depth and the, uh, the importance of what people share, trusted um, to us as researchers. But also there's, um, 
yeah, and also there's a lot in it. So I'm trying to figure out what is my perspective as someone who's very interested in puberty and late timing and early timing, and Neil always course corrects me. So it's like, just remember, it's absent. You know, this is not the same. So it's been quite a process. And I wanted to share today with people online and also people in the room some of the indicative observations by sharing some of the quotes that, or quotes that I've taken from the transcripts. Um, of course, these are not people's real names, and I'll fudge some of the ages um, up or down just to conceal their identity. So these were women um, at different ages. And, you know, so so Rosemary says, you know, and she uh, said, you know, my, my body is broken and I think this probably broke my mind. I, my, I think my parents thought if they got me fake boobs, then everything would be fine and it doesn't have the same effect as having puberty for real. So there's this real gender difference in how women and men experience pubertal absence, which makes sense if you think about what's going on now. But there were a number of women who were, got breast implants from their parents, or that was the advice they were given by the, the doctor, just get yourself a set of boobs and carry on, you'll be fine. Um, and, you know, and then Monica shared that, uh, she says that um, puberty, you know, real insight is puberty is such an all-encompassing thing. It's more than just physical development. It's a whole social process. And I didn't have any of that. And I look back and I think, if I had only gone through the process of coming of age, well, I would have avoided a lot of that inner turmoil. And she'd been talking about the some of the difficulties at, you know, managing her emotions and um, psychological difficulties in terms of anxiety and depression. So the women were framing it as something that they were told that it was about how their body represented to the world. They Most, but not all of the women referred to it as, prompting real psychological difficulties during adolescence. But most of them talked about it changing after that, often in relation to fertility treatment. I'm not going to present that today, but it's a fascinating one. Um, and then these are some of the things people shared about their social life during the adolescent phase. So they were asked to think back about how they experienced adolescence, their friendships, romantic interests, um, school friends and so on. Um, and you can read them there. You know, and people saying, like, I think it's too late. I think I will never be the same as my same age peers. I never learned how to be a friend because that period passed me by and I'm always going to be playing catch up. Um, you know, Maya here says, I'm, I still, it's like I'm still trying to play catch up with people that are in my peer group and I feel like I'll be doing that forever. And some of the participants who were older in their 50s and 60s would say, like, I knew there was something different about me and I feel like everyone else would know. So I withdrew. I didn't go to social things. I didn't hang out with people. I just withdrew, including early school leaving. So withdrawal from the school because of social comparison, because of bullying, because of comments being made about how their body wasn't the same as many of their peers. There were some similarities with what the men shared, including this idea of like who I could have been. You know, so there was some uh, kind of people were grieving or acknowledging that they were different people because they didn't have puberty. So the people weren't saying like, well, puberty drives this, Samantha, you know, that <laughs> drives brain maturation, drives this, but they had a clear sense of how this had reshaped them during the second and into the third decade of life including attributing their KS or the experience of not going through puberty and not having what they described as a real teen years or the real so-called real adolescence, that lots of depression and anxiety. So they were talking about whether they had a diagnosis or not uh, and a formal diagnosis or not that I was depressed, I was anxious, and this persists across the life course. And this is quite different. So some of the women, many of the women who talked about having anxiety and depression and drawing a, a strong line between um, having this condition said, but it's over now. Whereas the men were much more likely to say, and it persists with me to this day. Mm -hmm. My life has been changed and I don't think I'll go back to who I could have been. This notional idea of my, the life, you know, kind of the sliding doors of idea. 
Ben also um, talked about withdrawing from social groups during the, those teen years, um, giving things up, keeping themselves to themselves. And this wasn't unexpected. So in terms of how I would frame, you know, the importance of peer groups and social connection and and being engaged during the adolescent years, um, it wasn't unexpected. Um, and I was really struck, though, how, how close to the surface it was for most of the participants in drawing the links and feeling a lot of regret. So the older they were, the further away they were from kind of the second decade or the adolescent years, they were more likely to say, and I wish I'd done things differently. And so at the end of the interviews, I would say to people, is there anything that you wish that I'd asked or you wanted to share we haven't talked about? And most people had lots. Um, and consistently it was, I wish I could share this to, to younger people, that they didn't change their lives. And I think that's, that's wonderful. But as the young person themselves, that's a hard thing to hear when you're very different to your peers. Um, and I think so many of the people that engaged with the study were very educated about their condition, um, had were, were tended to be have access to treatment, um, and this isn't always true for a number of people with the condition, depending on where in the world they are, on the financial access and so on. I think there's still lots more work for us to do in the future. We have a whole kind of decade of research, I think, to do, perhaps more. But some of the observations I wanted to share today is that how many people that we spoke to draw a strong line. They attributed their lives now, their personality, how they lived, whether they had a partner or friends or felt comfortable in their own selves with the diagnosis of KS. Um, most men described experiences of depression and anxiety. Women did too, but women were much more likely to say, but it's over now, often related to fertility and um, being a parent in some way. There's a very gendered experience, which is, again, perhaps not surprising, um, but the timing of diagnosis and treatment is crucial. So, Neil, you talked um about this, about being sent off, and you're just a late bloomer and, and, and those, and that can have a, just a really devastating effect on someone. One, to be diminished in terms of reporting symptoms, but also not having access or not being provided with treatment that the person may want, which means that they will tend to go through the second decade without this treatment. The di time to diagnosis and the experience of diagnosis, or as it's described, the diagnostic odyssey matters a lot. And I think there's this, um, something that I'm still trying to work through is like how much does the, your, the person's age now matter? So as we go through life, and you kind of talked about this earlier, it's like, well, other things happen and you get on with life and your life gets taken up with other things that compete for attention. But at adolescence, your brain is hardwired to, be, to look for social cues for acceptance. So what happens at adolescence does stay with us. And People with this condition aren't the only people to withdraw socially. They aren't the only people to experience social exclusion. They aren't the only people to feel differently about their body or something about their appearance. But it's in combination with having a rare condition. Um, so I'm going to end this now and then share some experiences um, and Neil and I will take some questions. I really want to express gratitude for the participants who shared so much with us, very quick to respond. I think within a few days we had to close down recruitment because we couldn't handle, but, which is a lovely position to be in as a researcher. Um, but we kind of, we did close it after a few days because, pe and pe because we had so many people who shared so much and really contributed to the research. Um, also to Anna Barrett and Ali Toomey, who were BA students, uh, have since graduated, but who also contributed to this research study, including by interviewing. Anna is currently doing an evaluation of what is the experience with healthcare professionals uh, based on this data. And Dr. Andrew Dwyer, who's at Boston College in the States, who's one of our collaborators. 
I just um, might ask Neil to come back and join me up here and just talk a little bit about patient and public involvement in research. As many of you would know, this has kind of been dri driven in the last few years in Ireland and across the world. But sometimes I think it's quite constrained. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of little points I've added because the patients we talked to probably have never spoken about their condition mm. to anybody and never spoken about the technology. To have somebody to do an hour interview, sit down, listen to them, was probably very important for these patients mm. and very helpful mm. for them to be able to go through their experience because we never had that chance. Yeah. And as a patient advocate, I talk to patients all the time, hear the stories on Facebook, and all the other patient advocates around the world get these stories as well. Mm. But it's all just patient experience. Nobody takes us seriously. It's helpful now, Dr. Dr. Dwyer and yourself, taking this seriously. Otherwise known as Andrew and Samantha, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Let's try to formulate some sort of proper recognition that this happens to this group of patients. Hopefully then try and produce models, try and help other patients at least recognise this happens. Because I can say what happened in my experience, and I talk to lots of patients, I can talk, but I want other people to get the shared experience. Yeah, there's this tension, I think, between, so I would say that Neil is an expert, far more expert than I am. And but to be described as not being taken in that same way is very unfortunate. And I would like to say, this is one of the things that we want to change with patient involvement in research. And there's lots of, there's lots of patient advocates out there who yeah. go online, do, do the same job I do, just do it very quietly. But it's nice to have some sort of recognition of all the patients together to be able to access this. Yeah. And also to drive research, I think often in PPI patient public involvement in research, they might have quite limited roles. And this is rarely is a study like seeded by a patient. There's like, hang on a minute, how about me? How about how group? And this is where this research was done, but it's guided it the whole way. So I think it's been, of course, been enriched by Neil's experience as, um, as a patient advocate and lived experience yourself. Um, but it hasn't been easy. Neil has been frustrated with me at different times for how slowly I move. <laughs> so to, I don't know why you're laughing. Everyone knows I'm. Patients get frustrated with doctors for yeah. genetic results. They, yeah. they don't get anything back. They don't get back from their test results. So patients get very frustrated easily because they take part in all these research and never hear back the results. Yeah. Then they don't want to take part in other things. Yeah. But this is more important because it's like more hopefully practical help for them just to be able to talk about the condition, mm, yeah. I think, anyway. Yeah, uh, no, I agree. And I think, too, as every single person talked about, this is the first time someone's asked me about this. And they may have had multiple medical appointments or, or not in some cases, but, but this is the first time someone's asked me about me and who I am and how this might have shaped me. And there's a couple of things going on. One, it is a rare condition, but it affects so your psychosocial development um, in a way that other rare conditions don't. You know, or not in the same, not to the same degree, perhaps, or not in the not in the framework that I would think about it. And because it affects the development of puberty, so embarrassing to talk about. So you don't want to admit yeah. to your, you don't want to admit to your parents or friends. Your friends may notice. It sometimes helps to have one or two friends who can actually talk to you about it. But mm. I do remember, 12, 13 years old, I was a normal child, and then every else started doing their more adult teenage things, and I left that behind. I started making excuses not to do things, mm. and I remember that. No active decision to say, I don't want to do it. I just didn't feel mm -hmm. that was me. And some fellow patients said they just don't feel normal adults. Mm. They work, they function when they work, they have relationships, they still don't feel normal. Fully grown adults. up. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a common theme that came through. Like, I'm, when will I be a grown up? When it, I will never feel that I am. Um, even though they're doing all the things that we would identify as the tasks of adulthood. Yeah, I don't look like a little hormone condition. I look my age now because of the hair loss and well, I, I may look 53, but I don't always act 50. So I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. But so it's been. I think one of the things that I'd encourage people who have a, an interest in psychology is to think about um, collaborating with patients responding to their needs rather than like I would come at this from a perspective of oh this is really interesting from a framework of adolescent development and through the kind of process I think it's the, the research question itself has changed and we've come together so um, so this is what I want to share we, we'll be sharing this with um, directly back to the patients and then Neil will be just disseminating it in different forms both this talk and the, the research well, we have some time for questions. We might take questions either from the chat or from anyone in the room. Um, I do want to say thanks again to the participants um, who were a very important part. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, so we're happy to take questions from the chat or um, from the chat or from the room. A question coming in from Robert. There, thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah, really, really good conversation. One thing that kind of struck me in the topic of your online experience, like, I thought, like, um, just when you were talking about your online experience, but like talking to people online yeah. and kind of meeting them, is, I was just wondering, is that something that showed up kind of in the interviews or in any past research in this area? I was curious, or if it's maybe something that you were personally experienced for the community. I don't know if my life experience has always been different. I'd never like to say, well, I experienced the case the same as everybody else. That's why I try to be very careful when I talk to people. This is what I've done, even yeah. the mistakes I've made. This is how I've spoken to it. Then you can take that away and do, do you make your own decisions based on your experience. You may not, you may go better than I do. I like to tell people what I've done, but when I talk to other places, I say this is just me, and I try and give everybody quite a consensus idea. I don't want to speak for everybody, even though I just try and talk to as many people as possible. But that's why I try and be like a more rounded picture, because my experience is not going to be the same as other patients. I, at least I've tried that. Thanks. We have a couple of questions from the chat. I think the first one is for you, Neil. Okay. Uh, many thanks for that. Illuminating. Can I ask more about the anosmia? You mentioned you had more to say about that. No. The GNOH that goes to the hypothalamus, the new ones, nerve cells that release GNOH that go to the hypothalamus, travel on the same pathway in the brain as your factory smelling nerves. There's like a very scorpy, crude old factory plateau, if I remember rightly. There's a very small pathway but they travel mm. through, through development for about 10 to 14 weeks. So the GNOH neurons and the olfactory neurons travel on the same pathway, then diverge, one goes to the olfactory bowl, then the smell, one goes to the hypothalamus. Mm. And something in KS, or some of the genes, stop that movement because of adhesion proteins or other types of proteins that stop the movement of these neurons getting to the right place. Mm. They get blocked in the wrong place. Because they're yeah. traveling the same way, you get the smell blocked and GNOH blocked. They're only, quite, they're only linked, but they're in the same place yep. in the development of the brain during that 10 to yep. 14 weeks development. Yep. Other forms of KS, of course, when the is not working correctly, the olfactory bowl is normal. That's when you get the HH for the sensor stuff normal, the hypothalamus doesn't mm. work correctly. But the Kalman is when the olfactory bulb is not formed because the nerve cells haven't caused the right place at the right time. During embryological development. Great, thanks. And we have another one from Sarah Robinson who said, thanks so much. Um, uh, do your findings have any implications for signposting on spaces for mental health for young people who may not be experiencing or who may not be experiencing puberty? But how do we create or signpost resources for people? That's a question that keeps coming up, especially with the parents of the youngsters. They just get turned down. Doctors who just say delay, delay, and just go away away to see. There's not much out there, unfortunately, because they just don't get recognised. Mm. And it's different, different countries. Yeah, yeah. I think there's definitely country differences which somehow relate to cultural differences as well. But I think, Sarah, one of the difficulties is it's hard to signpost these places because by the time the person starts to think, oh, my body isn't changing, they're, they're a bit older anyway. So in terms of if you think there's something here about prevention and intervention and teasing out what that is, the prevention, unless there's very early diagnosis, but as Neil would say, you, because it's it's almost by a diagnosis by exclusion of all other things well, because there's no genetic test for yeah, this. Yeah, there's no process. test for them, HA, especially with women, you're just eliminating all the other forms of mm. infertility and fail puberty. Yeah. Then what remains is Kalman syndrome by HA. Yeah. So some in America they can't diagnose Kalman syndrome to you're 18 because they want to make evidence to it, even if all the other red flag symptoms like cleft palate, sense of smells, feeling yeah. there, they're not the diagnosed to 18 because they want to make sure. Yeah. They do treat them. Yeah. They just don't confirm the common. Yeah. And that's and that's one of the challenges I think we face. And there's more questions to be asked in terms of how culture, cultural context um, plays a role in this. So if we think about it through changes in, in the body ideal and the body esteem and people's ability to express different things during adolescence that are more or less free than in previous generations, uh, we see some work to be done. It's this really kind of interesting 
um, and meaningful interaction between a rare disease that affects you so profoundly at such an early stage of life and that persists. And the first step is just to try and describe how do people think about this. And so this is this is what we've presented today. Um, and there's more to come as we look at the experience of diagnosis, the interaction with healthcare providers, the value of the patient network, and those kinds of things. So thanks. There's, there's more coming in, but Sarah, I'll keep an eye on the chat later. Thanks so much for coming along. Thank you so much, Neil. You've been a brilliant collaborator. Really a wonderful collaborator, and thanks so much for coming over to Cork. Um, I keep saying next time he comes, it might be sunny, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks.